Hi, everyone. Welcome. This morning, we have Jeff Colvin from Fortune Magazine with us. Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Tony. Great to be with you. We're three months into the uh, crisis that was started by the coronavirus. You can tell it's been a long time since I've seen my barber. Um, and a lot's changed in the past three months. Um, your timing to be on with me this morning is really fortuitous because I got an email from Fortune about a uh, magazine online only on their website with an article by you uh, called Coming Out of the Crisis, The Boldest Companies Win. And not surprising, I read through the article and it fits with your book from 2009, The Upside of the Downturn, which was um, uh, revised in 2012. And in reading the, through the book yesterday and this morning and in the article, there are some sort of playbook rules and principles that the best companies and the most thoughtful leaders wind up applying at these times uh, to manage to come out stronger and seize the opportunities that exist. Um, talk a little bit about that and, and maybe the first story in the article about Uber Eats and Grubhub. Yeah, the, the, the article opens with a, a story about something that happened very, very recently. Uh, Uber was attempting to make a deal to buy Grubhub. Uber, of course, is also in the food delivery business. It's a big part of Uber's business called Uber Eats. And obviously Grubhub is in the same business. There are too many companies in that business already. We know there's gonna be consolidation. And it would have made a lot of sense to combine those two. Together they would have been a real giant, but they had problems. There were all kinds of negotiating problems they ran into and a uh, lot of negotiating. And finally, um, the CEO at uh, Uber just said, we don't need to do this, okay? We, we, we wanna make a deal, but we don't wanna make just any deal. And he walked away and he issued a statement saying, you know, we're, we're not pursuing this anymore. Within hours, a company most Americans had never heard of, a Dutch-based company called uh, JustEatTakeaway.com, within hours sweeped in and, and signed a deal to buy Grubhub for $7.3 billion. The reason this is an important story is that Times of turmoil like this really are when the greatest opportunities will arise. They're, they're painful times, but these are when the greatest opportunities arrive to change the competitive order in an industry. Uh, history shows us that the competitive order in an industry changes much more in downturns like this than in prosperous times. And one way that companies advance, companies seize the opportunity, is by making acquisitions, uh, even though it's a tough time to make acquisitions. And so what that relatively small Dutch company did may very well turn out to be a really smart move. It was bold, it was courageous, somewhat risky, mm -hmm. but it was probably a very smart move. And one of the other factoids in the article, um, you referenced back to the tech bus, the dot-com bus, I think, is it's pretty much known. And 47% um, of the leaders became laggards after a two-year measurement, and 13% of the laggards became leaders after that yeah. same two years. So obviously, they were doing something to change that competitive order. That's exactly right. And, and that's a, it's a great example because um, when you look at such a huge change as that, I mean, that upended the whole competitive order in that industry and it happened in just two years. And when you think about it, it makes sense. You know, when times are good, everybody's doing pretty well. It's difficult to uh, overtake someone who's in front of you. Uh, you know, everyone's getting along well. But when times turn tough, that's what brings out differences in companies that might not be apparent when times are good. And so the competitive order changes a lot. And that was really dramatic. I mean, here's a big, important industry. And all kinds of those leaders came out of the recession as laggards. Pre-recession laggards came out as leaders. 
And it all happened in just two years. You've got to move when you have the opportunity. Right. Um, and that reminded me of a podcast that I heard last Saturday as I was out running some errands. I had the Fortune podcast on the uh, Mary Barra yes. uh, interview. And you were part of that program and you gave some insights uh, into what they were doing at GM because she talked specifically about we had uh, plans on the drawing board for refresh on certain models and we scrapped those uh, as all of this started to happen and we decided to up the ante towards uh, electric vehicles because we believe that's where the future is and we started to take our people and our capital and put it in that direction. Um, and you were making some really good points about what she had to say. Yeah, uh, she's very good at this. And actually, I think that there's a great advantage of something that is always crucial for a business leader, but especially in times like these, and that is simply confronting reality. Uh, Jack Welch used to say, confront reality, not as it used to be, and not as you wish it were, but as it is. And that risks sounding just too obvious, you know, just too much of a truism. But I cite it because time and again, we see companies that just can't bring themselves to do it. I mean, a lot of us know personally, sometimes it's really hard to do. Companies have a hard time. And there are plenty of companies that try to deny things are changing, or it's not that big a change, or it's not going to affect us. All these ways to avoid acknowledging the change. She did it really well. She said, the world is changing, we have to change, and she did it. In a time like this, when it's clear the world is changing, what leaders have to do is fearlessly, unflinchingly face reality and say, how is our present and our future going to change and then do whatever that requires. And it's not easy, but no, it's no. mandatory. I wonder, and it's a little off topic, but we'll get back to, to, um, to the innovation piece and the, and the uh, seizing the opportunity piece. I just wonder with Mary Barra, she comes at all of this from an engineering mindset, right. which is so different from what most of the top leaders and companies have. I wonder whether that has any influence over the speed that she, uh, where she comes from to, to, to make a quick decision and also the respect for process, which engineers generally have. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. Uh, someone with that kind of background does have a very analytical way of looking at things and a, a real respect for what the results are and not trying to dismiss them or deny them saying, look, uh, if we've done the work, we've run the analysis and this is the result, then that's the result. Right. And uh, we're not going to fight it. We're just going to respond to it. Uh, it's a great mindset to have. It takes a lot of inner strength. And I have to say, having spoken with her, she's very soft spoken. She doesn't yell or pound her fist. But there is a steeliness that comes through in everything she says. Uh, she's clearly a very strong person and is willing to acknowledge these changes and respond to them, whatever they may be. And, you know, she's been, she's had an indoctrination by fire after That's for over, sure. that whole ignition issue with GM and um, I didn't realize till I was listening to the podcast or you were talking about her actually meeting with people who were the families of, of loved ones who died in crashes uh, or had serious injury in crashes as a result of the ignition problem. She doesn't shy away from that kind of stuff. And she said, this is something we do not want to forget. We do not want to put this behind us. That's a, that's a, brave, <laughs> that's a brave attitude. It's extremely brave, and what was especially notable about it is that it was very, very un-GM-like. Right. That is not the way the company handled these things in the past. And in fact, uh, I spoke to executives who said, 
what she did and what she said during that faulty ignition switch crisis was unlike anything any GM CEO had said before. We're not going to put this behind us. I hope we never forget it. You know, GM wanted to put problems like that behind it and forget about them and never mention them again. Uh, doing, as you mentioned, seeing the visiting personally with the families of the victims. This was completely un-GM like, and it took a lot of courage, but it had to be done. Yeah, she did an amazing job. Um, you talk about, uh, I'm just going to go through some of the, yeah. the, the principles that you talk about in the article this morning in Fortune. Uh, don't accept the new normal, embrace it, uh, update your business model. Uh, make strategic acquisitions. That goes back to the uh, Grubhub story at the very beginning. Steal great people. That is a huge one. There are so much, so much great talent out there that's being shaken loose in every single industry that there's a, a great opportunity for companies who want to make the move to get some terrific talent on board. Um, all of those are great points. In the end, you, as the leader and as the company, they need to actually move. They need to act. And it's easier, as you say at times, to protect yesterday Yes. and to keep thinking about yesterday and how are we going to get the good old days back again as opposed to this is what we have. Yeah. Let's move forward, figure it out. Yeah, absolutely true. I mean, it, this is always a crucial issue in business having to stop protecting yesterday so that you can start creating tomorrow. It's very difficult for companies to do, and it goes double or triple in times like this because we can see yesterday disappearing really fast. We don't know what tomorrow is gonna be, but we have to stop protecting yesterday and start uh, creating tomorrow. And there's actually some research on this because when you look at how companies respond to a crisis like this, it ranges on a continuum from at one end, just trying to hunker down and survive, cutting every cost you can cut, just trying to hunker down and, and survive. And at the other extreme are people who refuse to do that, companies who refuse to do that, uh, keep spending, increase spending, uh, and that has its dangers too if it's not disciplined. The winners are the ones who don't cut all their costs just trying to hold on to what they've got. They have the least chance of coming out of the downturn well. The research is very strong. They have the least probability of coming out well. The ones that succeed are ones that say, okay, we've got to get leaner in some ways. Maybe in operations, we can economize and make them more efficient. But the winners actually spend more on certain activities in uh, the, the downturn. They often spend more than their competitors on R&D, more on marketing and advertising, because that's the big opportunity. And that takes courage. There's no other way to say it. Your peers may not be doing it. It has some risks, but the research is very clear. Experience is very clear that the ones with the courage to act, to do these things that really do make sense, they come out of the recession as a winner. Well, and if there was ever a place to say, that's a wrap. That's the point. Uh, I was well made. And I wanted to make sure that we touched on uh, a few things that would give folks who are watching an idea of how they might move forward and having the courage to act, to act in the first place, yeah. um, not be paralyzed and having the courage to act is absolutely sort of crucial and fundamental to moving forward and seizing the opportunity here. So uh, Jeff, great article in Fortune this morning. For anybody who's watching, I hope you'll get a subscription to Fortune and read Jeff's work and the work of others, his colleagues. Uh, some really great material in there always. And 
uh, I guess one other thing, Jeff, you know, we haven't yeah. been doing a lot of in-person speaking, but you've been doing uh, some virtual speaking, which has been great, a learning experience for us all. Um, what's the most interesting thing about the virtual experience? Well, the most interesting thing really is that uh, you have to keep it moving and, you know, break it up. Uh, it's, it's not like an in-person event where people are sitting and they have nothing else to do but to look at you. And you do have that in-person interaction with them, even if it's a large group. When you're doing it online, uh, it is kind of like a TV show from the viewer's perspective. Um, they're just looking at the screen. And the other thing is they don't have a lot of people sitting around them, presumably no one. They do have alternatives, right? And it's tempting for them to go do some email or something else because it's so easy. So you've got to give them something that will keep them riveted on what you're talking about. And it can be done. I mean, that's the great, uh, the great news that comes out of this. It can be done. You have to take a different approach, but you can do it. And compelling content always yeah. is a winner, providing them something that they're that is giving them an aha moment, something that they wouldn't have thought of before. And that's where all of your experience at Fortune and talking to people like Mary Barra uh, and Satya Nadella and others who are the CEOs out there who are doing really a terrific job, uh, that's where your value comes in very strong for audiences and virtual events. So thank you for all you're doing. Appreciate uh, your time here this morning and onward into the future. Onward, the best word. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Take care.